Hey listeners, just a quick note that uh, today's episode might sound a little bit different than some of our previous ones, and that's because we had a bit of a technical glitch. Um, That means I pressed the wrong button on the recorder, so you might hear a little bit more ambient noise, and the recording itself just might not be as rich as it usually is, but thanks for your patience with that. Hi listeners, welcome to Grief Out Loud. Remember the last time you tried to talk about grief and suddenly everyone left the room? Grief Out Loud is opening up this often avoided conversation because grief is hard enough without having to go through it alone. We bring you a mix of personal stories, tips for supporting children, teens, and yourself, and interviews with bereavement professionals. Platitude and cliche-free, we promise. Grief Out Loud is hosted by me, Janet Christofaro, and produced by the Dougie Center for Grieving Children and Families in Portland, Oregon. This is another in our series on how the approach to supporting grieving children has or hasn't changed over time. We started with the 1940s, jumped ahead to the 1970s, and today we're making our way back to the 1960s. So if you missed the first two, be sure to go check them out. My whole life, I've referred to a man named Antonio Joseph de Cristofero as my dad's dad. It wasn't until I was in my 20s and someone said, oh, you mean your grandfather? That it kind of came to about who this person was or was supposed to have been in my life. My grandfather? I never knew him as that because he died long before I was born. You might be getting the sense that today's episode is pretty close to home for me. In working on this series, I realized that Anthony de Cristofero, my dad's dad, had died in 1963, and that my dad might be the best person to talk with about grieving a parent in this decade. Hi, Dad. Welcome to the show. Happy to be here, I think. (laughs) You think? (laughs) Before we get into what it was like to be a teenager when your dad died and what you needed in terms of support, since I never got to know your dad apart from a few stories that you and your mom have told me over the years, can you talk about what he was like? Like, what kind of father was he? Well, I think, typical of the 50s, he wasn't really absent, but it was mostly about him working and coming home and spending maybe one or two hours uh, with me and my mom. So I knew him mostly through his work, about him being a machinist. Went to his shop a lot. So that was what I knew about him mostly, but he was uh, an athlete. He liked, loved baseball. I was an athlete, and that was our relationship mostly. Through sports and... Sports, having a catch, going to football games. He was uh, a really hard worker. Uh, Near the end, he had started his own business, so that really took up a lot of his time. And then the other thing that's kind of weird is, you know, I grew up knowing that your dad had died when you were just a teenager because you were 14. And I knew it had something to do with something called a heart-lung machine. But to be honest, I like I never really knew the complete story. And even when other people have tried to tell me, like I can't ever hold on to the details about it. So what do you remember about the day your dad died? Well, I guess I can preface it a little bit with my dad being really, really sick at Christmas. And he made the decision to try and get his heart valves repaired. His other choice was to be wheelchair bound. So we trekked off to Philadelphia. We lived in central New Jersey. And he went into uh, a hospital there in Philly and had one of the first open heart surgeries. And the plan was to repair his valve. When the surgery started, they realized that it was unrepairable. So they put in think, plastic valves. What that did was extend the surgery out to about 12 hours, and he was on a heart-lung machine, a rudimentary 57-year-old heart-lung machine, before they had the technology they have now, for way too long. So he survived the surgery, went to see him the next day, and talked to him. He was up, he was alert, he was him. Came back the next day, And he had died. And he died from kidney failure. 
because they couldn't do anything about his kidney shutting down after being on a heart lung machine too long. Those are gory details. So complications from the surgery. Correct. Even though he survived the surgery, his body couldn't withstand what it went through by being on the heart lung machine for so long. Right. And then moving forward from that moment in the hospital, how did the adults in your life because we have a big Italian family. There were a lot of adults. How did they talk to you or not talk to you about what had happened? Well, I guess the thing that stands out in my mind the most was when the first uncle came up and said, hey, you're the man of the family. My mother flipped out because <laughs> I was 14 years old, and she wasn't going to have any of that. And I got a lot of mothering from all the aunts and but I was really just kind of disconnected. Just kind of floated through the whole process of going to um, the funeral home. It was a little strange because it all happened back in the Bronx. And we had been, I had been a suburban New Jersey kid for five years. So that made it a little unreal. The other interesting thing about that I remember that stands out is my dad had a doppelganger. And when he walked in to the funeral home, everybody gasped, mm. including me. So someone who looked just like your dad. Exactly. So even though you're 14 and you know that when someone dies, they die and they don't come back, there's still that shock that here's someone who looks just like him. Maybe he did come back. Yeah, well, I knew he didn't come back because I could see him in the casket, but it was a memorable moment. You mentioned that feeling of being just kind of disconnected, kind of floating through. It's a surreal world to be in this world now where your dad is no longer alive. And then also surreal to be going back to where you'd grown up for the funeral and, you know, other connections with family. What other ways did your grief show up as a teenager? Like, what did it look like? I was an angry young man. I was. I felt like we were on the verge of being a successful suburban family. I had been fairly successful in sports and I'm not, you know, a really good circle of friends. You were and about to make it in the high school world. Make it in the high school world. My dad was about to make it in the business world. We were about to step up from our old junky old cars to nicer cars, maybe a nicer house. It turned upside down and I was pissed. So such a sudden, unexpected death right in that really formative time. Yeah, it changed my, uh, well, you know, it, it changed my world dramatically at school, at home, uh, but mostly in, at, in school because I was a freshman in high school. So I was just getting started on that adventure. I thought I was going down one path, ended up with a whole different set of friends somebody else who lost their father. I guess from that point on in high school, I felt like I was outside looking in. Some of the other folks in this series have talked about how different they felt when their parent died. Oh, I felt way different. It was, it was like a U-turn for me. Did that, that sense of difference, did it come from what you mentioned you had one group of friends and suddenly you had a different group of friends? Was it what other people said and did in reaction to you, or was it just an internal sense that you had? I think it was more me than people shunning me. I just felt like I didn't fit. So I found some people that had the same experience. And did you talk about that, or was it just like, hey, you had a dad die, I had a parent die, we don't need to talk about it? I don't remember talking a whole lot about it. One of it was death by suicide. So we talked about that a little bit, I think. But no, it wasn't the center of our conversation. It was, you know what I'm going through. I understand what you're going through. And the other people around us don't really get it. I wanted to go back for a moment to what you mentioned about your family being on the verge of financial success. And then when your dad died, I'm wondering about the time period, you know, 1963, being in a pretty traditional, stereotypical situation where 
the dad is making the money and the mom is staying at home and, and how much that played into the financial reality after your dad died. Well, what happened was we had to face the fact that we were going to be subsistence surviving. Because my dad had been sick a long time, there wasn't any insurance available. So, you know, we were living on bare bones, social security, and some part-time work that my mom found after we moved. That was the other experience for me, is that I, halfway through my freshman year, life turned upside down. And then in between my sophomore and junior year in high school, we moved to get closer to family. Mm -hmm. So whatever connections I had made back in New Jersey, I had to start over again. So those friends that you had made after your dad died that had that shared connection, you had to leave them behind. It was like another loss. That and I was still doing a lot of sports and had a lot of close friends. Those connections remained. Those people were still in my life big time. But that went away when we moved. Yeah, there's all those additional losses that oftentimes aren't like in the the forefront of people's minds when they think about here's this teenager whose parent died, like that's the major loss. But then there's so many other ones of lifestyle changes and possibly having to move homes and change schools and so many other added layers to it. Yeah, piles up pretty good. You had a little brother in all of this. Yeah. Shout out to Uncle Tommy out there who might be listening to this. He was only three when your dad died. No, he was almost five. Oh, this is what happens when I don't get the family stories correct in my head. Yeah, he was almost five. He was going to be five in March. Dad died at the end of February. So you, angry teenager, kind of disconnected. Then there's this younger sibling. How did it change your relationship with him? Well, it didn't really change my relationship with him until I was probably a senior in high school. He's still my baby brother, so I I still had the same relationship with him. Do you remember talking to him about your dad? Mm, I don't. I don't. Later on, maybe, you know, he was much older and was interested in finding out some information. So it wasn't like a conversation at the dinner table where you and Nanny and Uncle Tommy are hanging out sharing stories about your dad? No, that probably, that was probably more likely to happen at a family party than people would reminisce about my dad. Were there things you wished you had received from the adults in your life in terms of support or the way they talked about your dad or explained things that they weren't able to provide for whatever reason? You know, I never really felt that. I just isolated myself. I never really wished that somebody did something else for me. I don't know, I guess I steeled myself against it and just charged ahead. I never really did look back. You know that Mom and I have been pretty adventurous. So it's always the next thing and the next thing and that next thing. Never really the last thing. Mm. How would you describe... Well, this is kind of a strange question because I'm about to ask you, how would you describe your grief today? Like, what words would you use? But I'm also wondering, when your dad died, did you think of yourself as having grief? Was that a concept you connected with? I, I didn't identify it as grief. Um, it manifested as angry. And when people crossed me, it came out. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, you've been hanging around with an angry 14-year-old for quite a few years. <laughs> My listeners, he's referring to himself. I've definitely seen it in the car. It still comes out there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> New dad, as we're talking, what I'm thinking about is the first two guests that we had on for the series, Dean and Kathy, they were both really young when their parents died. The adults in the life didn't really talk about it very much. They didn't have a place to go to talk with other kids. But then later on in their lives, they came to the Dougie Center and they became volunteers and they had an opportunity to really dive into their personal grief and then be a support role for other kids going through the same thing. And talking with them, they have a broad vocabulary 
to talk about their grief now in the present time. And as we're talking, I'm getting the sense that it happened and it got expressed as anger, but you never really had that chance to talk about it as an experience. No, never really did. People were grieving. The idea of grief as a thing didn't really exist for me. I didn't have grief support. I just had support. It wasn't consciously named for you. No. There were people there to catch me if I fell, but it wasn't defined as grief. I was really uh, wrapped up in what's my life going to be now. Not really grieving for my father, but about the loss of my expected life. You know, I thought I was going to be at PMOC on high school campus, you know, sports star, popular dude. Didn't work out that well, you know. Mm. So I guess it was more about that. It's like if someone had been able to come up and say, it's going to be all right, there'll be a way, you know, know, we're, we're here to support you. You don't need to worry about you or your little brother or your mom. Like some reassurance that there were adults on duty who were going to take care of stuff. Right. And the only thing, you know, the adult on duty was my mother. She took over being two parents, and she took it quite seriously. (laughs) (laughs) It's such a great point about when it, I think particularly, well, no, all ages of kids and teens that I've worked with, that idea that this person dies and they miss the person but then there's so much that they're worried about, about what their life is going to be like now because their kids and their teens and their adults in their life have such an influence over how everything goes from safety to food, to finances, to school, all those things. And that a lot of time in in our groups for teens, we spend time talking about the grief that's connected to life being different. Now the grief to the grief around maybe their plans for what they're going to do in school or out or after school have to change for a variety of reasons and they get a chance to talk with each other and and see how they're reconstructing their lives in new ways with these limitations or for some of them new opportunities that weren't there before so back to the question i was going to ask you how would you describe your grief these days time really heals stuff and it's really a dim memory because I've had so many other experiences. And it's always there, but it's a fading history. So as you've accumulated other life experiences, it's become sort of woven into that. It seems more inconsequential now. Mm. There are other things in my life. Like you. (laughs) Well, that's another interesting thing to wonder about, because... I mean, your dad died when you were 14. Your mom's dad died when she was seven. There's been a lot of people on your side of the family who died and died pretty young. And I, what's it been like to see me do this work where every day I come in and I sit with grieving kids and teens and, and kids just like you and kids just, just like your brother? Well, obviously, I think it's a wonderful thing. Something that would be beyond me. And we know that. <laughs> I'm sure it's something that I would have benefited from, but I don't think anybody could have conceived of it in 1963. Since I never knew your dad, what are the ways that you carry him with you? Well, one of the things I think of him that comes through me is that uh, he was a tool and die maker, mechanic, and I watched him in action at work. And I think that is imbued in me. I think so. I feel like I'm a competent mechanic that I can do stuff. <laughs> and I think that is him in me. Mm. And not just DNA kind of things. I think I got it from spending time with him. Since the whole point of the series is to look at how supporting grieving kids and teens has changed or not changed over the over the years. Since it was like, you, it was your dad dies in 1963, you're grieving, early grieving in the late 60s into the early 70s. Is there anything that stands out to you from that time period 
that you think either influenced or, or was a part of how you were grieving your dad's death? Well, I think uh, all teenagers rebel. I think my rebellion was probably intensified a little bit. I tried to be uh, more uh, unconventional, even from the people that weren't, you know, if they were one standard deviation from the middle, I wanted to be a little further than that. I did a lot of extreme things. And that was a time period, you know, in our culture of a lot of experimentation too, late 60s, early 70s. Absolutely. Well, I know it's been a process for you to come in here and be part of this podcast. So I appreciate you kind of pushing into an uncomfortable space to come talk about this. Well, I knew it would be comfortable with you. Well, that is a very nice compliment. Thanks again for being part of the show. I was absolutely happy to be here, and thanks for asking me. And listeners, thank you for being part of our audience today. If you are new to our show, you can find all our past episodes. We have over 85 of them. You can find them on our website, dougy.org, or you can find them in Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, any other new platform you might be using to listen to your podcast. As I mentioned, this is one in a series, so you can check out the 1940s and the 1970s. Today's the 1960s, and we'll be hopefully talking to someone from the 50s pretty soon, and then 80s, and who knows, maybe even to the 1990s. If you have an idea for a topic or you just want to give us some input about the show, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at help at Dougie.org. Thanks for listening. Hope you'll join us again next time.